morning. Good morning. Uh, this is Keith Slell, and we're here at actually at the colleges. We're not opening it up to the public, but we do have a few people here today, and uh, who, who are uh, and I think there may be one more yet yet coming. We're although we're not advertising it. So anyway, I just want to say good morning to you today. I'm going to be talking about something that could save your life, and I don't just mean. Uh, just just keep you in divine health, which is the title of our sermon, how to stay in, or how to get in divine health and how to keep it. But this could actually save your life, what you're going to hear today. Now, I have never done today, but I've, I've never done this before, what I'm going to do today. I'm actually going to quote from a book I wrote, uh, which was actually a dissertation for my PhD. Now, I have a THD in theology. That's a doctorate in theology. But I don't usually tell people this, but I also earned my PhD in science. Uh, with emphasis on the on the science of psychoneuroimmunology, and I'm going to be quoting from my dissertation, uh, where I quoted over 500 references to back up my thesis or my dissertation, and I've got some interesting quotations there from medical science about how to stay in good health. So if you don't want to get the coronavirus, because I haven't been talking about, it. and by the way, like I said in the email that you got, hopefully yesterday or this morning, the email said that I am not going to. Um, talk about all the bad news and give you more statistics. We hear that seven days a week. You can't turn on the TV now without the, unless you turn it into a, a Turner Classics or one of the movies. But if you just turn on to a typical news channel, that's all they're talking about is the coronavirus. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to stay in divine health, how to get it, how to keep it, and how not to lose it. <clears throat> because so many people think that they're going to get it. They're in fear. Now, God tells us not to fear. Do you know how many times the Bible says fear not, fear not, fear not? So we're going to talk about that. So let's ask God's blessing. Now, I've already prayed, but I want you to pray silently and ask God to bless me and anoint me as I teach this and to open up the minds and hearts of the hundreds of people who are going to be watching. Father in heaven, we thank you now for everyone who's, who's listening at the sound of my voice, and I ask you to anoint me and help me to do a good job on this so that I can help bless the people who are watching and I ask you to just open up our minds and hearts to understand what your word says. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, now, I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 9. And, and after I read you some scriptures about what the Bible actually says, I'm then going to show you what medical science says that backs up or agrees with what scripture says. Um, if you don't want to get the coronavirus, first of all, don't walk around in fear. Don't go around saying, oh, well, you know, I'm going to, be, I'm going to get this thing. I uh, recently had a relative who went to the hospital, and uh, her daughter told me that she is in real fear that she's going to get this thing because she's vulnerable and she's in the high-risk category, apparently. Um, even if you're in a high-risk category, I'm going to show you what you should do, so pay close attention. Now, let's start, if you've got your Bibles, in Matthew 9. Remember Matthew's, Matthew chapter 8? Uh, Matthew, I well, heard somebody come in. Did he stay? No, he didn't. Okay. So Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, those two chapters deal with uh, healing. And if, if, if you want to study healing, just read those two chapters and you'll get basically everything else that's in the four Gospels. Because those two chapters sort of summarize everything about healing and miracles and that type of thing. All right. Now, Matthew chapter 9, uh, we're going to start, uh, let's read verse 29. These two blind men came to Jesus, and he asked them, Do you believe I can do this? That's verse 28. And they said, Yes. Now listen to verse 29. He touched their eyes, and this is what he said. It's in red letters in your red letter Bible. According to your faith, be it unto you. Well, now, what if your faith is, I'm going to get this disease? What if your faith, you know, what is faith? The Greek word pistos means belief. If you believe that you're going to get it, he said, Well, now, according to your belief, let it be to you. Wow, you better be careful what you're believing. Now remember Mark eleven twenty three. 23, Jesus said, Whosoever shall say, and he gives an illustration, to this mountain. And then in Matthew 21, he says, or to the fig tree. I mean, you can say it to the fig tree, to the mountain, he said, or whatsoever. Whosoever shall say, whatsoever, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Now, God set it up that way so that when we speak by faith, we can get what we say. That's how God set up the universe. The universe is, 
a voice activated. God said, let there be, and there was. And then God says, now you can do the same thing. John 14, 12, you can do the same works Jesus did. So according to your faith, be it unto you. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 13. If you have your Bibles open, if you don't, you can just uh, write these down and look them up later. But if you have your Bibles, you might want to look this up. Chapter 8 and verse 13. Jesus said to the centurion, because he was asking Jesus to heal his servant, go your way, and as you have believed, as you have believed, so be it done to you. Now, that's God's will. God's will is his word. You learn that by comparing Mark 3.35 and Luke 8.21. You can find out that the word of God is the will of God. What God says is his will. So here's what God says. Go your way and as you have believed. Now what are you believing for? Are you believing for divine health? As you have believed, so be it done to you. Now that ought to scare the pants off of some people because they're they're, they're expecting to get sick. They're expecting to go to the hospital. They're expecting that I'll be the first one to get this. You need to quit that because as you have believed, Jesus said, let it be done to you. But, of course, he's hoping that you'll believe the right thing. What is it that we're supposed to believe during these pestilences and plagues? You know, the coronavirus is a pestilence, biblically speaking. It is certainly a plague. Now, in chapter 8 and verse 17... Why did Jesus heal people? Now, verse 16, he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all that were sick. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying that he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, Isaiah 53. Now, the King James in Isaiah 53 mistranslated that, but here they translated it correctly. Jesus himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. That's why he healed people. Now, that means that you don't have to get the coronavirus because he's already taken everything. Uh, I heard a guy yesterday on television, they were interviewing him. I think it was on Dr. Oz's show, and he said that he'd gotten the coronavirus, and it was much, much worse than the flu. And people die from the flu, from the pain. You know, when you get the flu, most of us have had it. Your hair hurts. I mean, your eyeballs hurt. Your skin hurts. I mean, just to touch you, it hurts. He said it's much worse. The pain is much worse. Now, here recently, they up until this past week, they have been saying that if you get it, you'll develop antibodies and you'll be immune to it. They've changed that now. At least some medical doctors have. And now they're saying that even though you may have already gotten it, you did not develop antibodies and you may get it again. In fact, people have already, they've already found out that folks who got the virus and got over it, and we call them survivors, are now getting it again. And that means you have a double chance of dying from this thing. Now, I'm not putting fear in you. I'm going to tell you how to have faith. I'm going to tell you how to not to have fear. But what I am saying is this. We're up against a real enemy. We're up against a very serious situation. Uh, and you can live by faith and not get it. You can live by faith and never get this mess. But now, you need to listen carefully. What I'm telling you today is not typical church. It's not church as usual. This is church, but it's not church as usual. This message could save your life and the lives of your loved ones, if you can get them, ask them to watch this. We archive this thing. Ask them to watch this video because it could save their lives. All right. So as you have believed, so be it done you. That's God's will. Now, 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes you were healed. And that's a paraphrase of Isaiah 53. Let me just turn to Isaiah 53. This message today is not just theology. It is very, very, very relevant to what's going on right now today. Now, Isaiah 53, the whole chapter is about Christ, about the Messiah and what he's going to go through. Now, listen to verse 5, one verse. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him so that we could have peace with God. The Lord, let's say, wait a minute. Oh, the, well, verse 6, I jumped over there. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I jumped by there by accident, but maybe God wanted me to read that to you. Now, let me go back to verse 5. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, listen to this, we are healed. Now, I've given my testimony to the students here and to our church here. We're at Ambassador Christian College here, and this is where we have church and class. Uh, and I've given my testimony of how I was healed of asthma, and um, and I, I'm not sure if I've done it before all of you or not, but very briefly, I mean very, very briefly, let me just tell you what happened. 
When I got a hold of 1 Peter 2, 24, one night, I was sitting on my bed reading that, and it said, by his stripes you were healed. And I got a revelation of that. I've been teaching it for years. I've been laying hands on the sick and seeing dozens of people healed. Some of them of incurable diseases. Some of them on their deathbed, and I've seen God heal them. And yet I still had asthma. And uh, because I'm still a student. I mean, we're all students. You should continue to study the longest day you live. You need to be a student of God's word. Because you can't learn much if you don't keep studying. And I was sitting there on my bed, and I read that verse, By his stripes you were healed. And I remember that Jesus said in John 17, 17, that God's word is truth. Now, it was true that I had severe asthma, and it was getting worse with age, and I won't give you the whole testimony. But anyways, we're getting very, very bad. And uh, all of a sudden, I said, God, uh, your word is truth, and your word says I'm healed. So I want to thank you right now. I'm already healed of asthma. Now, I didn't know the manifestation would occur anytime soon, but I said, I'm healed right now. I am announcing before God. I'm announcing before the angels. I'm announcing before the devil, if he's listening. I'm announcing before everybody, I am healed of asthma. And you can almost hear the demons laughing, saying, yeah, right. No, no, the Bible says I'm healed. If the Bible says I'm healed, I don't care what the demons say. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what my body tells me. I could have an asthmatic attack an hour from now and fall down on the floor and, and gasping for breath. It doesn't matter. If the Bible says I'm healed, I'm healed. And I told God, I said, I'm just announcing. I'm not asking for healing. I'm announcing, God, I have healing. It says so right here. I mean, you can pick up your Bible and show it to him. Look here, Lord, it says right here. Now listen to this verse. By his stripes we are healed. We're healed now. So keep your healing. I'm going to teach you how to keep your healing so you don't get the coronavirus or other stuff that's going around, even including things like cancer and so on. We are healed. Once you get a revelation that we are healed and you accept that revelation, watch what happens. The manifestation will then occur. I know. I've experienced it. Now, let me... Let me read to you Matthew 21. I won't, I'm going to get into some of this other stuff here in just a little bit. And I probably won't take the whole hour that I usually do. This will probably be a little shorter um, message today. But hey, what you're going to hear is chock full of information that you don't want to miss. And it comes right out of the Word of God. Now, Matthew 21, because even the medical science scientists that I'm going to be quoting agree with the Word of God and what I'm going to be sh showing you. Matthew 21 and um, let's see, where's oh, verse 22. All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. All things. God, heal me, keep me healed. I ask you to keep me from getting this. Whatever I ask believing, I'll receive it. I'm asking you to keep me healthy. I could be in a room full of people who are dying of this stuff, but I'm asking you to keep me healthy, and I believe you will. In Jesus' name. By the way, some time ago, I gave a revelation of what it means to ask in Jesus' name. And I've been following that revelation ever since. When I pray in his name, I say, God, I'm asking you as if I was Jesus, and I know you'll do it for him. John, uh, what is it, 16, 23, whatever you ask in my name, he'll give you. How did Jesus know he'd give it to me? Because he knew that anything he asked the Father, God would give it to him. Remember on the night when he got arrested and Peter pulled out his sword and he was going to kill them all? He tried to cut the guy's head off. That's why he ducked and off went his ear. But he tried to cut his head off. And Jesus said, put up your sword. Don't you know that I can right now pray the Father and he shall give me? Not he might or he could if he's in a good mood. He shall give me right now legions of angels. I don't need your help, Peter. All I got to do is pray the Father. Jesus had such confidence that God would answer his prayer. He said, all I got to do right now is pray the Father and he'll send legions to defend me. That's how much confidence Jesus had that his prayers were being heard, that his prayers would be answered. He said, now, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Now ask in my name. Ask the Father in my name as if you were me. He'll give it to you. Why? That your joy may be full. So when I go to God and pray, I say, Lord, I know you'll, you know, I know you'll, if Jesus were asking, I know you would. Now, I'm not Jesus, but I'm asking in his name. And I know you'll give it to me. And I just believe it. I just believe it. Now, believe doesn't mean you kind of sort of are inclined to kind of accept it. Believe means you know it. Uh, the definition of faith is when you know something. A lot of people think faith is wishful thinking. You hope it's right. Um, I, you may have heard me tell this story before. Years ago, I was sharing with my mother the definition of faith. I said, faith is when you know something is true. 
I said, for example, I have faith that, that the sun will rise tomorrow. My mother said, you don't have to have faith for that. You know that's going to happen. I said, that's it. That's what faith is. When you know something is going to happen. See, the sun hasn't risen tomorrow yet, but I have faith it will because I know based on the laws of science that it will. I know based on the laws of God and the promises of God that I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. I'm healed right now. Why should I get sick? I'm healed right now. Now, Jesus said, live by every word of God. I'm going to live by Isaiah 53, verse 5. What about you? I'm going to live by 1 Peter 2, 24. What about you? I'm going to live by Matthew 21, verse 22. What about you? Are you going to live by it? If the Bible's just a religious book, toss it aside. You don't need it. But if it's the word of God, live by it. I got to, I got to be careful. I'll start preaching here in a minute. So, <clears throat> now let me go back to Matthew 8. Going back to that again. Those two chapters, 8 and 9... <clears throat> will really help you. <clears throat> All right, Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8, and let's go to verse 26. Now, you remember the story where they were in the boat, they thought they were going to perish. It says that in verse 25, they said, Lord, we're going to perish. Now, that's the faith they had. They, the word faith in Greek, pistis, is the word translated belief. Their belief was they were going to perish. So he stated his belief. We perish. That's verse 25. Verse 26, red letters, read it. Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Well, Lord, look at what's happening. The winds are coming up, and our boat's about to sink, and we're going to perish. Lord, look what's happening. This coronavirus is killing thousands and thousands of people. Look what's happening. And Jesus says to you, oh, you have little faith. Why are you fearful? Well, but, 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 Lord, look what's happening. Why are you, why, why are you fearful? I'm here with you. I'm the same yesterday day in prayer. I haven't changed. I'm with you. In fact, I'm in you through the Holy Spirit. Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? He's talking to the disciples, and he told the disciples that, that their name was written in the book of life, and your name's written in the book of life. Do we have a question? We have some amens. We have some amens? They're not here to say it out loud for themselves. Oh, okay. The chat, so amen and preaching is good. Okay. So, so if I get a little bit preacher, y'all preaching, y'all won't matter. Y'all won't care. Okay, keep on going. Right. So why are you fearful? But well the, well, the Lord, the reason I'm fearful is because the doctors say, the medical scientists say, the President of the United States gets on television, he's telling us, and uh, the doctor uh, uh, Fauci, whatever his name is, and, and then the, um, what's the guy who's the uh, doctor? The, the Surgeon General. Surgeon General, thank you. The Surgeon General tells us it's bad. So why shouldn't I be fearful? The reason you shouldn't be fearful is because Jesus Christ says you don't have to be. And he's your Lord, and he's your Savior, and he's your healer. You understand? He is our shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I won't want. I will not want, meaning I won't be in need. I won't be in lack. Why are you fearful, oh, you of little faith? If you're fearful, you're of little faith. And let me tell you something that maybe you didn't understand. Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is here, fear is there. What is faith? It's meditating on the promises of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you meditate on the word of God, your faith begins to grow. What is fear? It's meditating on the lies of the devil. And as you continue to meditate on the lies of the devil, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. Guess what? Your fear grows and grows and grows. That's why you don't want to be involved in the occult because when you're involved in the occult, that you're letting the devil into your life and there's going to be panic attacks that people have. There's going to be fear all over you. I had a lady call me one time. She said, I'm having a panic attack. And I said, what are you afraid of? She said, I don't know. I just feel fear. And I told her to take those pictures of witch doctors and shaman off her living room wall. That was an invitation to demonic spirits and she didn't know that. She was in the New Age movement, you see. But she called me up because she thought maybe I could help her. Well, I hope she did what I said. But if you don't do what God says, then you're not going to be much help. You know, the Bible says don't have these images. Images are portals to the spirit world. If you have, if you have pictures of Shiva, and I've seen this, uh, uh, statues of Shiva, uh, which is one of the Hindu trinity, if you, and, they're, and 1 Corinthians 10 says these, these uh, gods that they worship are actually demons. If you have pictures of these statues like Buddha, <clears throat> maybe you've got a jade Buddha sitting in your living room, those are portals to the spirit world. 
Don't allow them in your house. Get rid of them. And then ask God to forgive you. And then ask God to put his angels around about you. So don't invite these spirits. So we don't have to do that, do we? Now, <clears throat> let me go to Mark 16. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. If Jesus said, why are you fearful? You don't have to have fear. He tells us, as you have believed, believed means as you've had faith, so be it unto you. So faith is the opposite of fear. Fear and faith are reciprocals. They're opposites. If you have great faith, you don't need fear. In fact, I asked God one time, I said, how come you're so big on faith? And I didn't hear a voice, but God will speak to your heart sometimes. I know some people make fun of that. But um, thank you very much. So if you have faith, you don't need to have fear because faith is the opposite of, of fear. And, and I asked God one time, why do I have to have all this faith? And the thing that dropped into my heart was, and it's just like God spoke it to me, when you have faith, you're demonstrating your love. When a wife tells her husband, I love you with all my heart, I don't believe a word you say. That makes him not too, too um, he doesn't feel loved. When somebody trusts you and they have faith in you, they're demonstrating love. You feel loved, but you don't feel loved when they don't demonstrate faith. Do we have a question? Willie and Lorette Quaver. Jesus gives us common sense, but a lot of people are not using common sense when it comes to obeying the laws of the land. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't like going to the doctor because they say the doctors are, doctors are not from God because they use medicine and pills to treat people. Are doctors ministers of God or ministers of Satan because they use pills also? Yeah, doctors are not ministers of Satan because they use pills. They're trying to help you get well. Also, should we go to the doctor when we are sick or believe God will heal us? Uh, both. Uh, uh, in, in fact, Dr. Bernie Siegel, a very famous on, oncologist, he said you should do everything that you can do. Pray, believe, have people pray for you, go to the doctor, do whatever, do everything you can. And I agree with that. You should do everything you can. Here's the thing. God helps those who help themselves. If you're not willing to go to the doctor and you're not willing to, to do your part, then why should God do what you can do for yourself? You know, it's not wrong to take an aspirin if you have a headache, unless your doctor says don't take an aspirin. Uh, Remember, Luke was a physician, and God didn't throw him out of the church. Paul carried him around with him. Where Luke was one of uh, Paul's companions, so Paul carried a physician around with him. Not that he was sick all the time, but he did have a physician. He had a few lawyers around him, too. Good question. All right, now, so I asked God, why are you so big on faith? And it's because it demonstrates love. Now, th there's a scripture I wanted to come to. First John, it says, perfect love cast out fear. Perfect love, first John it's in First John, on the right page, I think. Anyway, it says, perfect love cast out fear. If you have perfect love, you're not going to have fear. If you have perfect love, you're going to have faith. If you have perfect love. All right, Mark chapter 16, Jesus said this. These signs, verse 17, Mark 16, verse 17, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out devils because when Jesus did it, as Jesus Christ, the devils left. If you do it in his name, it's like Christ himself is doing it, and therefore they'll leave. They'll take up serpents. You ought not do that on purpose, but Paul did it by accident, and God didn't let him die from it. And those serpents over there are like cobras. And so they thought he'd fall down dead any moment. He just kept right on going. He just trusted God. And if they drink any deadly thing, now don't drink deadly things, but if you do by accident, it shall not hurt them. If you get around somebody with this coronavirus, don't be in fear. Be in faith, trust God, and say, it's not going to hurt me. Now, some people say that's arrogance. That's pride. No, it's believing what God said. I'm saved. I'm going to live forever. Is that arrogance? Heck no, that's not arrogance. God said, if you believe, I'll save you. I said, okay, Lord, I receive it. I'm saved. That's not arrogance. I'm going to have eternal life. As far as I'm concerned, I got it now because I'm going to live forever. I know I'm going to live forever. I'll be here 10,000 years from now. I'll be here 10 million years from now, and so will you. That's not arrogance. I'm just believing what God said. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. 
So for the, if there's anybody out there that's already got the disease and maybe you're watching wondering how to get rid of it, get somebody to lay hands on you or lay hands on yourself. I've done that. And believe God, one night I caught the flu and I've, I'd had the flu so many times I recognized it. I mean, I woke up at 1130 at night. My eyeballs were hurting. I had a horrible fever. And this was years ago. I think it's before I started the college. And I knew that I had the flu. And I got up out of bed and I didn't even turn the light on. I just walked back and forth, back and forth, quoting scripture, quoting scripture, quoting scripture. Quote it from in here. Thankfully, God's written his law in my heart. And I said, Lord, I'm healed right now. Thank you very much. And I, and then the thought came to me, if you're healed, why are you out of bed? It's 1130 at night. I said, okay, I'm going back to bed. I went back to bed and fell asleep just like that. The next morning I woke up, no fever, no pain. It's all gone. Do we have a question? Two, Two questions. Okay. First one, what is the definition of perfect love as Christians? How do we demonstrate it? <clears throat> will in your next place? <clears throat> How do we demonstrate perfect love? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And also in 1 John 5, I think it's verses, verses I think it's verse 2. For this is uh, the love of God that we keep his commandments. And this is 1 John 5, 2. 2, and maybe 3. 3. And 3. Nine. So if uh, this is how we know we love the children of God, if we love God and keep his commandments. And 4, 18, 1 John 4, 18. It says God is love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love yeah. casts out. Casteth out. Because First, fear has no torment. Fear has torment. Brother, does it ever. He that fears is not made in perfect love. Yeah, he that is he that fears is not made perfect in love. That's first John four eighteen. Yes. Now Matthew and fifteen. And then there's another question. <clears throat> okay, another question, all right? Yeah, with the delay, I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about. <clears throat> all right. But um Rod Fishman is asking, is that in early editions? Early editions. I don't I'm with the delay and you know, I'm not exactly sure what he's mm -hmm. is that in early editions I'm not sure what he's referring to I don't there. know either with yeah. the delay I'm just not sure if you're talking about an early edition of a, of, of a virus or something it doesn't matter what part you're in I mean you could be in the last stages of dying I, I prayed for a man who was in the last stages of cancer he had terminal cancer and God healed him uh, Matthew 16 no, Matthew 15. Now listen to this. Matthew 15, this lady, very familiar story. She came to Christ and her daughter was grievously ill, vexed with a demon. And uh, she, was, she was a Gentile and Jesus said, well, you're not in covenant with God. And so even the disciples said, send her away, verse 23. He said, I'm not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he still didn't heal her daughter. But she had great faith. Verse 28, Jesus realized that she had great faith. And here's what he said. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you even as you will. If you have great faith, he, this is, now he's no respecter of persons. Be it unto you even as you will, if you have great faith. All right. Now, I want to read to you some quotations here. I'm going to make it quickly, but I want to read these quotations to you from medical science. They say that faith works. Now, not all these, probably none of these are Christians. I don't know, but listen to what they say. Uh, in an interview with Blair Justice, Ph.D., professor of psychology at the University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston. So these are not just the barber down the street and his opinions. These are experts here. He wrote a book. He's, he is a, an award-winning medical writer, and he wrote a book called Who Gets Sick? How beliefs, that's faith, moods and thoughts affect our health. And this is what he said. Habitual negative thinking can be a risk factor in determining our susceptibility to different types of cancers. Now, at that time, nobody ever heard of the coronavirus, but it still affects various things can affect uh, what, what we get. So, it, you know, not to get cancer, not to get all these other diseases, including the, this virus going around, don't have negative thinking. People with a strong sense of control over their own lives tend to have a positive outlook that enables the immune system to do its work properly, making it less likely that these cancerous cells will develop. If you don't want to get cancer, don't be a negative person. And if you don't want to get any disease, for that matter, Dr. Justice adds that, quote, feelings of helplessness, unquote, contribute to ill health. Feelings of loneliness have been found to be a factor in lower immune functioning, but social support seems to strengthen the immune system. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, 
Doctors cannot heal you with a pill. What they do is work with your immune system. So if you keep your immune system strong, then you're more likely not to get sick to start with. And if you do, you're more likely to recover and recover more quickly. <clears throat> Even eating a proper diet is not enough to guarantee our immune system is working properly. Stress can damage our health as well. Hans Sell, MD, in his book, Stress Without Distress, he, he says there's a great deal of evidence that positive emotions, such as love and humor, and possessing a positive mental attitude can strengthen our immune system and help protect us against disease, any disease, not just cancer. And her book, Lick the Sugar Habit, Nancy Appleton, PhD, talks about eating excessive sugar can mess up your body chemistry. She says, quote, we exhaust our immune system. She insists that we take responsibility for our own health and avoid sugar when possible. And I just had a few helpings of ice cream yesterday before I read this. And I wrote it. I'm quoting these guys. <laughs> Dr. Lyndon Smith, former clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Oregon Medical School, uh, he said if stress is chronic and if the body is not receiving the proper nutrients, some disease, some disease will likely develop. <clears throat> now, there's a book written by, called Sugar Blues, written by William Dufty, who was married to the famous legendary actress Gloria Swanson. I got to hear her speak one time and actually had lunch. I and about three or four other guys, we had lunch with her husband, William Dufty. He didn't talk about Hollywood. What he talked about was diet and, and nutrition and sugar. He wrote this book, Sugar Blues. And, and he said that once he changed his dietary habits, specifically regarding excessive intake of sugar, that he began to even look younger. Uh, he claims that by accepted diagnostic standards, our entire society is actually pre diabetic. Fighting disease. I didn't get to meet his wife, unfortunately, but I did get to have lunch with him and talk with him, ask him some questions. Do we have a question? So being happy is the best thing to strengthen our immune system? It is one of the best things you can do is being happy. Have a sense of humor. You know, if you haven't laughed in a while, watch the Three Stooges, and if you hate them, buy you a puppy because you'll start laughing with them. It really, pets can help you laugh. And the book, Fighting Disease, The Complete Guide to Natural Immune Power, because you've got to strengthen your immune system, by the editors of Prevention Magazine. Uh, they came up with a 30-day program to help a person re retain or regain their health and strengthen the immune system. Um, here's what they said, develop the power of positive feeling. I'm not gonna read it all. It, take a vacation from stress. Set up an exercise program that you can stick to. Regenerate your immune system with sleep. Get proper sleep. Take control of your personal environment and reach out to the folks around you so you want to be social. You don't want to be a recluse or be a hermit. They guarantee that if you follow this program, you'll have strength in your immune system to enable it to resist, quote, resist everything from marauding microbes to prowling protozoa. Now, I won't read all of these things here. They've got 30 different things here. And I'm just going to read you a few of them, but listen to this. Put the B vitamins to work. That helps stress. you got to get rid of stress to keep your immune system healthy. Develop an image of health. See yourself healthy. Now, if you see yourself in the casket from dying from this disease, you better watch out. You're hurting your immune system. See yourself healthy. See yourself victorious and a conqueror. The Bible says we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Develop an image of health. Sneak exercise into your life. Start a walking program. If you're over 35, you need to check with your doctor first, they said. Begin walking at a brisk pace three to five times per week or whatever is comfortable, and then add a few extra minutes to each walk over a period of time as you continue to build up your health. Start a food diary. Make sure you're not eating a lot of junk. Make sure you're eating the green stuff and the various colored vegetables. Read the comics. That's good for your health to read the comics. Getting upset will affect your immune system. This is all part of reading the comics now. This is number 11 here. Approaching stressful situations with a sense of humor actually strengthens the immune system. Studies have shown that laughter actually increases antibody levels. Learn to laugh and let go, they said. I think his name was Norman Cousins. He was dying. He had a terminal disease, so he quit work. He was a column, syndicated columnist some years ago. So what he did was he quit work, locked himself in, up into a, in a hotel room, and bought 
all these videos that he could find with the Three Stooges and the Marx Brothers, and he sat there and laughed and laughed and laughed until he laughed himself silly and his disease went away. And he wrote about it because he was a journalist. He got rid of his terminal disease from laughter when the doctor said there's nothing we can do. See, the doctor can give you a pill that works with the immune system, but if your immune system is shot, what can the pill do? So he built up his immune system through laughter. It actually affects the antibodies in your body. So what I'm telling you, they could save your life. Uh, go to bed and uh, at the same time and rise at the same time. That helps your immune system to regenerate itself. You should even do this on, on weekends. Go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time. Use sunscreen. Uh, Short-term research has now proven that short-term effect of overexposure to sunlight is results in a suppressed immune system. Too much sunlight. Don't be around smoking. Don't be around tobacco. Secondhand cigarette smoke can suppress the effectiveness of your immune system. Here's another one. Act like a cockeyed optimist. I'm going to stay healthy. You better not say that. You might get it. No, I'm not going to get it. In Jesus' name, I'm not going to get it. Let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus would be afraid right now if he were here in person? Would Jesus be walking in that door saying, Oh, I'm so scared, I'm so scared. Would you, would you, can you imagine Jesus being afraid of this virus? The answer is no, he would not be afraid of this virus. Now, Peter tells us that Christ is our example. 1 Peter 2.21, Christ is our example. We ought to walk in his steps. Would he be afraid? Remember he walked up... Remember in chapter 8, the first healing that's recorded in the book of Matthew, there was a leper that said, Lord, you can heal me if you will. The Bible doesn't just say he stood back and said, Woo, don't get close. It says he walked up and touched the leper and said, I will be thou healed. The leper was healed. You see what I'm saying? Jesus wouldn't be afraid. Fear is the opposite of faith. What does Hebrews 11, 6 say? It says that without faith, we cannot please God because you can't love, show love to God if you don't have faith in what he says. So be a cockeyed optimist. Put away <coughs> anxiety and fear. Have a positive outlook. That's what they say. Put away anxiety and fear. Uh, vegetables. Eat yellow, orange, and green vegetables because they have high amounts of beta carotene um, which, and, and, and a lot of vitamin A, which strengthens the immune system. One carrot contains about 20,000 or 25,000 international units, and that's what, you don't even need that much, but one carrot will give you that much per day, if you eat one carrot a day. Or eat uh, uh, one sweet potato, that'll give you about the same, about the same amount. Uh, these vegetables, coupled with a cup of greens, such as collard or turnip greens, if you like that, gives a tremendous boost to your immune system. Learn how to play. Be like, don't be childish, of course, but be childlike. Scientists tell us that childhood games may improve the function of the immune system. Go out and play cowboys and Indians. I'm going to see if I can find my cowboy gun. And, you know, no, I'm kidding on that. But, you know, do something that, that some people think is silly. Go out and just have a good time. Enjoy. Be a child. You know, children, they just have laugh. You know, I, there was a scientific study how much children laugh per day. They laugh over and over until they start school anyway. They start they laugh and they have a good time all the time. They're always laughing. Pick the right vitamin supplement. The recommended daily allowance for magnesium is 400 milligrams. You always want to take calcium with your vitamin C, and calcium needs uh, two things, magnesium and vitamin D. I used to sell vitamins, and I studied that. Get rid of anti-sleep habits. Only use your bedroom for sleeping, and if you're married, for intimacy, but never use it to solve the day's problems or to argue with your spouse. You just don't do that. A little bit more here. Regenerate your spirit uh, through prayer. This is from a scientist now, from a medical scientist. Uh, meditation or relaxed prayer, it produces body chemicals that, are, that positively affects the immune system. When, when you stay in prayer, you're going to be healthier for praying. You say, but my knees hurt. Well, go out and take a walk at night. Look up at the stars. You've you got to talk to God when you're looking at the stars. And just spend time with God. Praying positively affects the immune system. 
eat fish. You need zinc, you need uh, 15 milligrams, don't take too much, it can suppress the immune system, but you need somewhere around 15 milligrams of zinc daily. The American Heart Association recommends that you eat two servings of meat, poultry, seafood, nuts, dried beans, peas, or eggs every day. Don't be around pesticides. That, that wrecks your immune system. If it kills unwanted pests, it can kill you. Uh, find alternative methods to using pesticides because they're deadly. Uh, get a lymphocyte check. A lot of people, just before they die, their lymphocytes, the count goes down drastically just two or three days before they die. So you might want to get your doctor to check that for you. And according to Boston University's David McClellan, PhD, trusting and caring for other people may have a powerful effect on the immune system. Take care of other people. Students who watched a film on Mother Teresa seeing her do good deeds, just watching her do good deeds, had caused an increase in their antibody levels. Don't watch the bad guys on TV. Find somebody that, that, that find something good and positive and watch that and see somebody doing good for somebody else. It increases the antibodies, therefore improving your immune system. Just watching someone else do good deeds strengthens the immune system. If you help people in need, find ways to serve others and minister to their needs, you will actually be helping your own immune system. This is from medical science. That's from David McClellan, PhD, uh, who worked with Boston University. Norman Sheely, MD, has created a program uh, referred to as Biogenics. And he talks about Let's see here, get, get his quote here. He said this, in a test of over 300 cases, he taught the patients techniques for manipulating mentally their immune system. You can mentally inc increase it, you can manipulate it. The results were that 98% of those who practiced the techniques, just 15 minutes, three times a day, experienced a shrinking of their cancers. So that would also work for you. Three times a day, if you practice those, some of the techniques I've shared here about relaxation, thinking positive, those things, using relaxation techniques, you can use progressive relaxation where you strengthen your, you know, tighten your muscles and relax, and uh, and so on. You could, you know, a lot of you know about that. Sheely, Dr. Sheely says, once you, now listen to this, once you achieve such control, emotional stress is regularly canceled and no longer harmful to the body. And each day you'll tune in more and more to universal life force. Now he's not a Christian necessarily. He calls it universal life force. He said, you may call it God, which works with your highest inner being to achieve physical, mental, and spiritual health. Now, turn, tune in to, to this universal life force. He said, you may call it God. As Christians, it is God. We need to tune in to God. This is a scientist telling us this. We need to tune in to God every day, and we'll build up our immune system through prayer. Do we have a question? Those that are disciples of Jesus. Paul said uh, to depart and be with Christ would be better for him, but he said it'd be better for the rest of the church if he'd hang around. I think it's better for me to hang around because people are being blessed by this ministry. And the healthier we are, the more we can do for them. Yeah, and the healthier we are, the more we can serve other people. So here's the thing. Selfishly, Paul said, I'd just rather go and be with Christ, but he said it's, but he wanted to be unselfish and he wanted to do more for the people and for the church. I mean, right now, if I just suddenly died, I'd be with Christ in eternity. It'd be great for me, but it, I mean, in my consciousness, it might be 200 years in the future, but it would be to me just like that. But yet there's so many people that would not be blessed who are being blessed by this ministry. Do we have another question? Rod Keithman says, my new King James says, Mark 9 through 20 is not in the original text. The new King James says that? That Mark 9 through? 9 through 20. Oh, oh, chapter 16, 9 through 20. The New King James was written by the editors of the NIV who, who uh, also believed that that, but remember, the NIV was not based on the original Greek, and the New King James is simply the Old King James updated, but when they tell you that Mark 16, verses 9 through 20 is not in the original Greek, it's true it's not in the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus, but it's in more than 95% of all Greek manuscripts but the NIV chose to use the Westcott and Hort text, which was based on those corrupt manuscripts. Yes, it is in the original. And one final thought about that. Why would Mark tell you about the death of Christ and not tell you about his resurrection? Because verses 9 through 20 talk about his resurrection. 
if you read the NIV, by the time you get through, you're going to have so many doubts you won't believe any of it. Because at, on the bottom of every page, just about, it says this may not be in the Greek. This may not be in the Hebrew. This may. It causes all kinds of doubts. Because Jesus, the, Jesus said there's a book called If the Foundations Be Destroyed by Chick Salaby. That's a great book. If the Foundations Be Destroyed by Chick Salaby, you can buy it online, I think. And that is an excellent book. And after you read that, you will not use the NIV again. And remember, the New King James while it's better than the NIV, it was written by the same people. So, it's bad. To maintain normal fitness, says Dr. John Danchik. He is president of the such, such Medical Association, Chiropractic Association, it says. He said you should exercise at least 30 minutes a day, four times a week. Exercise strengthens the immune system. It enhances self-image. It's an aid to sleep. It's beneficial for releasing tension and reducing overall stress, which can suppress the immune system. Don R. Powell, PhD, author of A Year of Health Hints, 365 Practical Ways to Feel Better and Live Longer, that's the name of the book, he said that you need to listen to relaxing and soothing music. That's not heavy metal. <laughs> Practice autogenic training where you're using biofeedback techniques where you're you know, feeling uh, very relaxed. I won't get into that now, I don't have time. But, and I've actually been hooked up to a biofeedback machine and I could go down slow my brain rhythms down, that's where you can actually benefit health-wise. Health uh, you can gauge your progress until you know yourself to be relaxed. A little bit more. Dr. Powell also suggests we laugh and cry to release tensions. Learn to accept criticism. Stop worrying. And what are people doing? Even church people, they're worrying. They're in fear over all this mess. Slow down from a hectic pace. Budget our time. Overcome workaholism. Keep cool in a crisis. Don't lose your head because you have Christ with you. The book Everyday Health Tips, 2,000 Practical Hints for Better Health and Happiness, written by the editors of Prevention Magazine, they suggest you buy a pet. Pets can lower blood pressure. They can raise the chances of surviving a heart attack and can boost your health and morale. It, uh, when you hug somebody, then it releases endorphins in your body. If, if you get a good hug from somebody, and if you don't have anybody to hug, hug your dog. They say even hugging a teddy bear can help. Well, that's the next quotation here. Today, a growing number of MDs and psychologists are prescribing hug therapy for health maintenance. Some doctors have suggested there are health benefits from cuddling teddy bears. If you don't have anybody else, cuddle a teddy bear. Wow. Our relationships, now this is science. This is not preachers who are a little bit, you know, odd. these are medical scientists today. Our relationships with people, our attitudes and thoughts, how we handle stress, our, and our positive or negative outlook on life will be a determining factor in our overall health. People with pets have been found to recover faster from illnesses than those who have no animals. Quote, pets also seem to help a person to be more optimistic, another quality that contributes to better health. She's got a point there. She's, Anna said most of what we worry about doesn't happen anyway. That's true. And Carolyn says hugs, yay. Carolyn says hugs. Okay, yeah, we need hugs. Carolyn's right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Suzanne Cavassa, uh, she says people, I'm quoting now, this is a quotation, people who use religion or faith to give them a sense of meaning and higher purpose have a health advantage. These atheists, if they if they're get a, if they're even around coronavirus, they just look at it. They, they may get sick. They don't have the advantage you and I have. You and I have a health advantage. Every time I talk, my nose itches. It doesn't itch unless I'm talking, and then it itches. It rattles my nose. I don't know what to do about that. When I, I've been doing radio now for all these many many years, and nobody sees me if my nose itches. But when I do television or doing this, you know, I start talking. I even do it in the classroom start talking and it makes that happen people who use religion or faith have a health advantage she said um, they have more control over how their body reacts and what stress chemicals it produces in an interview with Gerald Jamposki MD and co-worker Diane B Sersion uh, I can't pronounce the name but but uh, they're with prevention magazine also they said, Dr. Polinsky is convinced that thoughts can affect the course of an illness, he said. And then she said, I keep thinking here of the word control. When people are consumed with fear. Now that's the problem I'm addressing today. If you have fear that you're going to get this 
virus. Remember what Job said? The thing that I, I'm looking at the clock back there so I don't go too long. The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. It's almost like what we think about, we attract. Almost. He said, thoughts can affect the course of an illness. And then she said, when people are consumed with fear, when they're running scared from illness or whatever, they lose control over their perception of what's occurring. They lose control. And you don't want to lose control of your, of your health. <clears throat> she also said this. Listen to this. <clears throat> Feeling constantly helpless can upset our intracrine balance, elevating the immunosuppressant hormone cortisol. That suppresses your immune system and destroying its natural diurnal rhythm like your like nightly rhythm. Chronic helplessness also depletes the brain of the vital neurotransmitter norepinephrine, which is like nor... Uh, uh, what's, the, what's the brand name for epinephrine? Um... Adrenaline. That's the brand name for adrenaline. So there's something called adrenaline and noradrenaline. It's just simply epinephrine and norepinephrine is all it is. And it can mess that up. Chronic helplessness. Oh, I'm helpless. What am I going to do? No, don't feel that way. Don't feel that way. You have Christ. Immunological studies, too, reveal that the inability to feel in control of stress rather than the stressful event itself is the most dangerous thing to immunity. The feeling of, of stress can be worse than actually the, the event itself. Just the fear, like, like Anna was saying. The worry itself can be, sometimes that never happens. And the worry itself can affect your immune system. Most of us eventually will feel that life is out of control in some way. Sooner or later, you're going to feel that way. It's going to hit you. Just a little bit more. In his book, Stay Alive All Your Life, Norman Vincent Peale suggests that we replace worry with faith in God. He further advises that reading the Bible will encourage faith, absolutely, and that one should commit to memory those passages dealing with faith. I don't necessarily commit them to memory, but I just read them and read them and read them until they stick. Worry, frustration, fear, panic, and unhappiness describes the one who senses he lacks control in his life. As psychologists have said, these ingredients leads to sickness and disease. Therefore, we should hardly apply the antidote to fear and anxiety, which is faith in God. Another way to eliminate anxiety is through perseverance, no matter how hard the going. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the famous theologian of the 19th century, said, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. Giving up produces a feeling of anxiety and failure, and that can suppress your immune system. Now, we have another question? Okay, we'll take it. Meditation in Beverly, as long as you don't get involved in the religious aspects of yoga what that does is that stretches the muscles and it keeps you uh, flexible that oven by itself i've even heard people like pat robertson say that's fine just don't get into the the prayers of the yogas and things that don't don't mess with that but the actual exercise itself has actually been proven to be good for you some of the different, there are different kinds of yoga, and some of those. Yeah, like Kundalini yoga, and that's, you don't want to mess with that. Is, yeah, you want to be careful about that, but the basic yoga. Like the, the poses and the stretches. And, yeah. But if you're going to meditate, wouldn't it be better to, instead of just meditating like they teach you in a yoga class, to sit there and pray while you're doing it instead? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you this. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Herbert Benson with Harvard University Medical School did a study of transcendental meditation. And he found out they lowered their stress, they improved their immune system. <clears throat> Just keep the religious aspect of it. And to answer your question, you can meditate and pray at the same time. You can. Meditation, as the term is now used in medical science, refers to lowering your brain waves from the beta wave frequency, which is 8 to 13, I'm sorry, from, um, from 14 to 21 cycles per second. That's what we're at right now. If you're playing basketball, it's even higher than 21 cycles per second. Your brain beats just like your, your heart beats. Your brain beats much faster. There's a, there's a brain, I don't know what to call it, it, it beats. <laughs> and uh, so when you, when you lower it down to 8 to 13 cycles per second, that's really, really fast. But, but when you lower it that way, it, 
it produces that they call that the state of meditation and you're not asleep you are awake yet you feel you can start dreaming if you're not careful because you're so deeply relaxed and if you were to do that I, I, one scientist i met some years ago said if you were to do that 15 minutes a day three times a day you'd never get sick so i don't know if he was right or not <clears throat> but he had studied all of that for like 40 years <clears throat> now here when i went after my PhD. My PhD is in primarily in psychoneuroimmunology, and Dr. Dr. Bori Cinco pioneered that particular science. Uh, she and her husband, and here's what she says. She says, um, she, gets, she proves that what one imagines at a subconscious level has tremendous power in producing physiological changes in the body. And then she gives an example. Women with morning sickness, were told that, that they would receive a powerful anti-nausea drug. But they did an experiment. Rather than give them an anti-nausea drug, they were given syrup of ipecac, a powerful drug used to induce vomiting in cases of poisoning. But because they told the women that's what they were giving them, and the women had faith, they believed what they were told, the results were that most of the women reported reduced nausea and had few stomach contractions due to the power of their own belief, which was stronger than the drug. The subconscious mind. Jesus didn't say believe in the head. You know in the head you believe in your heart. What you believe at a subconscious level can affect your health and keep you alive during all this mess that's going on. Dr. Carl, now by the, way, by the way, let me read to you John 9 here. I want to read you another scripture here. John 9. I may hold you over time. I thought I'd get out early today. I'm trying to. John chapter 9, verse 1. They saw this blind man who was born blind from his birth, and the disciples said, why is he blind? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? What happened here? And Jesus said, said no, he, he wasn't. Nobody committed a sin to cause this particular blindness. People can just simply be blind because of medical problems or whatever at birth. So uh, he, he did this. Verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground right in front of the blind man who could hear everything that was going on. He spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind with, uh, with of the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And then he said to him, go wash in the pool, pool of Siloam. What was Jesus doing? In that day and time, they believed that spittle or saliva had medicinal properties. So Jesus condescended to that man's level of belief and said, oh, okay, this man believes that spittle would, it might work to heal his eyes, so I'm going to work with what he believes. So he took, he could just lay hands on him, but the man, apparently, I don't know, Jesus may have had a conversation with him before all this happened. We don't know. But anyway, he took spittle, put some clay, put it on his eye, and I go wash. And it worked. You have to find out where a person's level of faith is and work with them at that level. What did Jesus do? Well, <clears throat> there's such a thing called a placebo. <clears throat> now, the mud didn't do a thing for his eyes. The spittle sure didn't do anything for his eyes. <clears throat> However, if the placebo effect may have kicked in, and Jesus, who invented everything, John 1, 3, everything was made, was made by him, he invented the placebo effect, which is simply our subconscious healing our body. In other words, even an atheist has inner healing in his body. Even though he doesn't believe in God, he gets a cut on his finger. The body is, in, is, is created in such a way to heal itself. And so the placebo effect is very strong. What happened here with Dr. Borisenko? These women who were experiencing morning sickness and had severe nausea, they were told something, their belief kicked in, and the placebo worked. Now, you've heard of double-blind experiments that medical doctors do. They'll take a new drug, and they'll get a people, let's say 100 people, just pick a number, and they'll take half the people and give them the actual drug. They'll take the other half and give them nothing but a placebo, a sugar pill. It has no medical efficacy whatsoever. But what they'll do is they don't tell the patients, and they don't even tell the doctors, so the doctors cannot prejudice the results by treating one group different than the other group. So the doctor doesn't know which pill is the real pill. Let's say the red pills. Well, one's placebo, one's real, but they're both red. And so each group that they're working, they know they got two different groups, but they don't know who's getting what. So they treat them both equally. And they always find out that the placebo does work. It doesn't work as effectively as the drug in most cases, but the placebo does work. People taking the placebo get well. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. 
So the subconscious mind can heal the body. And the subconscious is basically your heart, your spirit. Romans 8, Romans chapter 2, verses 28, 29. The heart is the spirit of man. Your inner man, scientifically speaking, the subconscious, it works. If what you, the faith you put in there will help you to stay healthy. Dr. Uh, Carl V. Holmquist said, when a person concentrates on positive emotions, on a continual basis, his body is free from stress and he's more apt to experience normal health. A few more quotations and we'll be done. There's a question. Okay, we'll take the question. It's Alma Chase that was asking, what Bible do you suggest is the best? Uh, certainly use the King James Version as your study Bible, but I would recommend of all the King James uh, Bibles, you get a study Bible, and I use the uh, 1909 uh, Schofield with the original notes because 1967 edition, they changed some of the words. Some, most of that was good, but not all of it was, so I used the, the, the Schofield Reference Bible. Now they're calling it a Schofield Study Bible. It, it's got a wonderful, excellent outline. Not all the notes you'd agree with, but most of them you would. The man who was the leader of the uh, what used to be the Radio Church of God, I didn't know it until after he died that he used a Schofield Bible. I've been using one for years, but that was his Bible of choice, too, if that means anything. Now, um, let's see. Okay, I read that to you. We're just about done here. Some people choose <clears throat> to be pessimistic and think negative thoughts about their health. You don't want to do that. Dr. Holmquist says this, quote, now listen to this. Another key to manifesting constructive ideas through suggestion is to visualize the result. Don't see yourself in the casket. That's bad. See yourself alive, healthy, and well, and feeling good. See what you want as though it has already happened. Jesus said in Mark uh, eleven twenty four, 24, when you pray, believe you receive and you'll have. Believe you receive it as if you've already got it. Most people do that, but they do it in a negative way. They believe they've already got the sickness before it even hits them. That's worry. They may suggest the positive, constructive idea, but then they visualize the opposite, and they, they, then they confuse their mind. So they, they say, okay, I'm going to stay healthy, but then they see themselves sick. So to keep it straight, suggest what you want, says Dr. Holmquist, and then visualize it by using the imaginative faculty to see it as though it has already come to be. That's from a medical doctor. Neg negative emotions and wrong imagination can also cause sickness if engaged in repeatedly. Repetition of either good, constructive imagination or repetition of negative imagination is the key to the effect. Dr. Uh, Paul F. Daniel in his book, Mind and Energy, agrees that repetition is the key in influencing the powerful subconscious mind. What you repeat over and over is going to hit you. Last page. Uh, in their book, Succeed and Grow Rich Through Persuasion, Napoleon Hill and co-writer E. Harold Keon have some things to say. And uh, they agree with Dr. Paul Daniels' postulate that you can draw the things you desire to you. The authors say, form the habit of keeping your mind occupied with what you desire and keeping it off the things that you don't desire. Don't be thinking about getting sick. Think about staying healthy. Your thoughts tend to manufacture the circumstances that occupy your mind the most often. Oh, I'm already out of time. I've got one more scripture to give you. Can you just wait? One more. Well, let me tell you something. One more about the, I'm going to go to, um, actually, there's two more. I just thought of another scripture I need to give you, too. Uh, there was a man who uh, got well. He had a... He had a very serious illness. Let's see if this thing works. There we go. Um, he was told he was going to die. And the doctor said there's a very, very powerful drug in France. But it's very expensive and it's still experimental. But would you like for us to order that for you? Well, the guy was dying. He said, sure. So he, they said it'll come to Paris, come from Paris, and uh, it's going to be very costly, but it just might save your life. And it has saved a number of people's lives. So he was very excited. So they ordered this very powerful drug, and uh, they gave it to the man, and guess what? He got well, totally, completely free of the disease. Uh, some months or some years later, he, was, he picked up a magazine that had an article about that very drug, and he remembered the drug that saved his life. He said, oh, I want to read that. 
And medical scientists had determined that that drug was utterly useless, totally worthless. They said it had no medical efficacy whatsoever. It was nothing to it. He read that and he said, oh no, then that means I'm going to die. And a few days later, he fell over dead. The mind can affect your health. He believed that drug. That's the placebo effect because the drug apparently didn't heal him. It was his belief. It was, to use the Greek word for belief, faith. It was his faith. Just like the man had faith that that spittle would, would, would heal his eyes. And Jesus said, okay, we'll use that. Jesus didn't need to do it, but it helped the man. And so this man, true story, took this drug that was worthless, but he thought it was powerful. He got well. Isn't that amazing? Now, I want to read you two more scriptures, and then we'll conclude. Can you stay with me just for just a couple of more minutes? Psalm 91. You knew I was going there, didn't you? Those of you who are Bible students, he's, he's going to go to Psalm 91, just as sure as I'm sitting there. All right, Psalm 91. Now, the Bible says if we'll confess Christ, confession is made unto salvation. For with the mouth, with the heart, this is uh, Romans 10, verse 10, with the heart man believes unto salvation. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation or healing or whatever it happens to be. We are to confess what we believe with our mouth. Psalm 91 verse 2 says, I will say, are you doing this? I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, and he's my God, in him I'll trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. What is this coronavirus? It's a noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Jesus said that in, in Matthew 23. If you uh, Like, a, like a, a hen that takes care of her chicks, he said, I would have covered you just like that if you didn't come to him. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Listen to this. You shall not be afraid. Are you afraid? You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the pestilence, verse 6, that walks in darkness. There's a pestilence out here. It's killing thousands. You are a Christian. You shall not be afraid. There it is. Thou shall not be afraid for the pestilence that walks in darkness or the destruction that walks at noonday. A thousand will fall. You know, they're going to die at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. People are dying all around you from this coronavirus. But it shall not come nigh thee. Confess God's word. Live by his word. How do you live by it? You believe it and you confess it. For by the, with the heart man believes unto, and with the, con, with the mouth confession is made unto, whatever it is you're asking for. In this case, to stay healthy. That'd be in divine health. A thousand will fall over here, ten thousand over there, but it won't come near you. Only with your eyes you'll behold and see the reward of the wicked. It's like... Uh, people that are atheists. I feel sorry for them. Because you've made the Lord your habitation, there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. And if somebody has coronavirus and they knock on your door, brother, I mean, when, when their hand touches the door, that virus is going to die on the door. It's not coming near inside. You're going to believe this. You say, Keith, that's silly. That's crazy. You want to die or you want to live? You want to believe God or not? God said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. It's up to you. You choose. You got life. You got death. What do you want? You want to live? Then do what God said. Don't be afraid. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any, pl any plague, any plague, that's the coronavirus, any plague come to your dwelling, any plague at all. Now, next year, they may come up with some other kind of a plague. We never know what's going to come up with next. He'll give his angels charge over you. Now, God says this in verse 14, because he has set his love upon me. This is God talking to you. Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. God promises to deliver you from the coronavirus because you've set your love on him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. God loves you. Are you getting this? He shall call upon me. I'll answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. You may be the only one in your family that doesn't get sick, but God's going to honor you. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that beautiful? No pestilence will come near you if you'll trust God. The last verse I'm going to read. I'm sorry for holding you over time. 
I hope everybody's still watching. Hope they make it. Yeah, we've still got the same number of people watching. Okay, good. Night. Let me read you just one more. This is from Re Revelation, and then I'll conclude with this. <clears throat> there are people, Carolyn said, um, there are people who are dead spiritually, yet walking as alive, and they're dead and don't know it. And yeah, like the Sardis that. Church, yeah, they're mm -hmm. spiritually dead. Now listen to this last verse, and we'll conclude. I'm not going to give you the reference. I want you to listen to it. Then I'll give you the reference. You can look it up in your own Bible. The fearful, that's people that don't have faith, and unbelieving. The fearful and unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. That's how bad fear is. Fear without faith, you cannot please God. And you've got to have faith that God's going to protect you and believe it. Read Psalm 91 again when we get through here. Read it again. You may want to read it two or three times. Think about it. Meditate in the scriptures. Meditate in what that says. The fearful and unbelieving are going to end up in the lake of fire. That's how bad fear is. Fear is a sin. Why would it be, why would you end up in hell for having fear unless fear is a sin? Fear must be a sin. Unbelieving. If you're not believing for God's promises, you're in trouble. I mean, this is worse than getting the coronavirus and getting sick. This is ending up in the lake of fire. Let me read the whole verse. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers. If you're fearful and unbelieving, you're in the same category as an abominable or murderer, an abominable person. And the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. The fearful and the unbelieving is in that same category. The fearful will have their part in the lake of fire right alongside the abominable persons, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars. Imagine that. What is the conclusion of the matter? Without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, you cannot please God. Make up your mind. I'm going to trust God. I'm not getting this sickness. Ark 11, 23, you can have what you say if you don't doubt that what you say shall come to pass. I am not going to get Now, let me tell you this. I'm not a spiritual giant. I, uh, I want to be, and I'm working on it. I'm not a, a, a faith giant, but just like you, I'm a student of faith. I'm a student, and I have to do what I'm teaching you, and you have to do what God is teaching you also. Because God is teaching me through his word. He's teaching you. And all of us together in the same boat. I'm not staying, I'm not your example. I'm not up here. Christ is our example. And he didn't have faith, a fear. He had faith. Amen. I hope you got something out of this today. Uh, send us your comments. Any other questions you might have. Thank you for the questions we did receive. Go over these scriptures and think about them. And if I missed any comments. Because sometimes they come in fast. Yeah. They, for some reason, don't update on my screen until I go back and come back in. And I'll get Dr. Cloud to come back and listen yeah. to all the comments, and he'll respond to anything. Yeah. She might have missed some of your questions, and it wasn't on, on purpose. No, it's not on purpose, I promise. Not on purpose, she promises. So if she did, you can still send them in. So God bless you all. God keep you healthy and strong. But another, I'm going to say. Okay, do we have something else? You do mention a Leviticus 11. Yeah, Leviticus 11, you need to stop eating those unclean animals because that's where the coronavirus came from in the first place. So they tell us that in China, these people were eating unclean animals and got sick, and then it became a contagious disease. So stop disobeying God. Faith without works is dead. you got to have faith, but you got to be obedient too. God bless you all. Please uh, share this with other people, and I'm sorry for holding you late. Tune in next week. We'll, we'll have some more. I don't know what God will give me next week, but be watching every week. And thank you for your comments.